I'm Charles. And I'm Frances Hunter. And we have never been more excited in our entire lives than we are right now. And for the Happy Hunters, that's really something. But you know what we're excited about? We're excited about the heating explosions that are occurring all over the United States. And the one that you're about to watch is the one that was televised live in Lakeland, Florida, where we trained approximately 1,200 ordinary believers to go out and to lay hands upon the sick and see them recover. And that's what you're about to enter into right now is a meeting where Pastor Carl Strader said, I've never seen anything like this in all my 30 years of Pentecost. And I believe that you will agree with us that it's an exciting thing to see and to hear what is happening through the ordinary believers as they lay hands upon the sick and they see them recover. Now, you might be saying, well, how did you teach them that? Well, we do it a very simple way. Everybody has to read the book, How to Heal the Sick. Not only read it, you have to study it so that you will understand how healing can be taught and how healing can be accomplished through you as you minister healing to a sick person. And then you need to watch the 12 hours of video that we have. Well, after you've done that and you attend the live teaching sessions and a little bit down the line, you're going to see the doctor's panel where we will have doctors examine patients. We will have chiropractors examine people, give you their diagnosis, and then you will see them healed through the hands of ordinary believers just like yourself. Well, get ready, get set, and God bless you as you watch this. And now, let's give them a standing ovation, everybody, as the Happy Hunters come and minister to us. God bless you. Double it for Jesus. Come on. Hallelujah. Let's really hear it. Glory. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Father. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, come on. Oh, you can just feel the Spirit of God in here. Turn to your neighbor and say, this is your night to explode. <laughs> now say to them, it's my night to explode too. All right, you may be seated. Welcome to the first heating explosion ever held in the state of Florida. And we believe that this one is going to create history in the body of Christ. You know what I'd like to ask? One of the first things, I would like to see how many of you are here tonight who have qualified to be on healing teams. Would you stand up? Look at this. Look at this. Is a this exciting? You may be seated. You may be seated. Hallelujah. Well, I'll tell you, all I can tell you is that Charles and I are really excited. Some of you may be wondering, what is a heating explosion? Maybe we better start off at the beginning and tell you what a heating explosion actually is and how we happen to be involved in heating explosions. <laughs> well, we discovered it in the Bible. Just before, well, just before Jesus left the earth, uh, he got his far-sighted glasses on and he looked down to 1985 and he said, wow, look at that group of people I've got on earth. And he said, I want to tell you something in advance. Every one of you people that believe in me are going to preach the gospel. You're going to cast out devils. You're going to speak in tongues. That means you're going to be baptized with the Holy Ghost and be endued with power. You'll be able to handle the old devil, the serpent, and all of his poisons. And I want to tell you something else, Jesus said. Every single one of you are going to be out daily healing the sick so that people believe in me. That's what Jesus said. And this is the day. This is the day. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. But what we begin to discover is we came into Pentecost 
they didn't just roll on the floor and they just, just didn't have artificial emotions. We discovered that there was some scattering power over the earth. We never got very close to it because we were afraid of tongues. But then when we finally met Jesus as a baptizer and we were endued with power, we began to study as business people what is it this missing that so few get healed? We would see a Catherine Kuhlman and we'll see an Oral Roberts or someone like this and, and they would get into where they could get some results in healing. But for the most part, it was just a healing here and a healing there. And we tried it out and it was sort of a, almost worse than anything we'd ever seen. We got about, one, about 10 out of 10,000 healed and we discovered we were trying to do it without the power of God. When we got the baptism of spoken tongues, then we knew we were filled with the power of God but how do you dispense this power that's in you how do the multitudes that Jesus said filled with the Holy Ghost actually filled with God and filled with Christ Jesus having all the power and all of heaven and earth everything to do anything that needs to be done on earth because God is that powerful and living in us he's that powerful so how do you find a way to dispense this power out to get people healed consistently repeatedly wherever you go whether it's in business or in your street or in a school or in a church, wherever, to successfully, uh, repeatedly get people healed. How could we do this? So we begin to study it. We begin to uh, experiment with it. We begin to look in the Bible and find all under those little precious stones in there. We begin to find new things in there that were really there, but they weren't there to us until we experimented. And we begin to find certain areas that God would reveal to us that we could consistently get people healed. And so we, we finally got it up to maybe 20%. It's estimated that uh, uh, most healing ministries that you've read about in books, they run 5 to 10, maybe 15 or 20% at the highest in that. Well, that wasn't what Jesus said. He said, folks, I'm going to tell you, you're going to do all the things I did. He got 100%, and we haven't attained that on earth. But we got the reasoning that if Jesus comes back in the next few weeks, months, years, however that time is, and nobody knows, but how many thinks it's going to be real soon? Wave your hand at Jesus. See, the whole body of Christ worldwide knows that it's going to be soon. Well, we got the reasoning that if we're going to do it, we better get with it fast, or we won't get it done before the return of Jesus. And he said it would happen. And so we begin to... Uh, to write down some of these things. We finally wrote the book to heal the sick and that book is accelerating all over the world now where people are actually saying, hey, it works. Uh, it works. It works. It works. It works for me. And so they begin to see that in little dribbles. And then we, we taught this on, in our Bible school and we videotaped it. And so we got out 12 hours of tapes on teaching people how to heal the sick. And uh, it was going, you know, reasonably good. We were getting some people to believe in it and go through the training, and it would work for them. But then finally, uh, a healing explosion. I'll define it, and then I want Francis to tell you how it got started in our lives. What we call a healing explosion is different than uh, just a miracle service or an evangelistic service. Uh, we have always been the ones who ministered healings. But we decided that an audience this far how could you lay hands on 5,000 people, 10,000 people, even 1,000 people? How can you successfully do that when you cut it down, you have maybe a tenth of a second per person? Well, we can almost get it that fast, but not quite. Well, we begin to see the acceleration, so we're seeing 80 and 90 percent of the people we touch healed in services like this. We haven't attained 100 percent, we're about to. I mean, all of us in the body of Christ are about to. And so, uh, the idea of a healing explosion came from God in a special way, but a healing explosion differs from an ordinary healing ministry in as much as we train a group of people, and those people, under the training of our 12 hours of video and studying our book to heal the sick, and then coming in in advance for some live training, which we'll be doing a little bit tonight, and with uh, you won't know it, but you'll be getting trained tonight. And then tomorrow and the next day we'll be ministering training. And then Tuesday night we'll come in for what we call a healing explosion. This is the second one we've ever had. The first one was in Pittsburgh. We had 11,000 people. We had over 1,000 on the healing teams. We had hoped and prayed for maybe 240, but it exceeded 1,000. And, uh, and so this became a healing explosion for the people to do it. It was so exciting in Pittsburgh as we saw the multitudes come out of these, uh, this big auditorium, the seats up in the, uh, you know, it's a big bowl in the Pittsburgh Civic Arena. And as they began coming out, 
and we had the healing teams all lined up around the floor of this big arena where they play ice hockey and things like that. And as they came through, people said it was like walking through the hem of Jesus' garment, and they were getting healed just walking up to these people. People were getting healed in the audience. And when finally they got down there, uh, a medical doctor who's got, well, we'll tell you more about him later. He's sitting on the stage up here. But he described it, that it looked like organized chaos. But he said, when I focused in on what each of these ordinary believers were doing, he said it was the most incredible sight I'd ever seen. That uh, one right after the other were getting people healed out of wheelchairs and all. And that became very impressive on earth. It became an exciting thing, the greatest thing we've ever seen. Russ Bixler, who uh, owns and operates Channel 40 in television, well known over the Pittsburgh area, he said, I've heard of healings like this overseas, possibly, but I've never heard of it in the United States, and now I've seen it. I've seen it in front of my eyes when thousands were healed by the power of God. That's a healing explosion. And the second one that's ever been held on earth is right here in Carpenter's Home Church in Lakeland. And we are extremely excited about it. And so we began to computerize all the applications that came in. And they brought us a report that we have 832 on the healing teams already. We had a little over 1,000 in Pittsburgh. Well, we know what happened in Pittsburgh. We had maybe 500 when we got there. We had over 1,000 when we got through. And then, and then we heard that uh, Carpenter's Home Church here has been playing a video school, and they're all over the state of Florida, too. This is just one. But uh, I think they got up to 430 or 460 yesterday were in here for the healing uh, team uh, teaching. And they registered 430-something, and they said, we finally gave up, and there's 40, 50 more we know of that didn't register that will. And so we're seeing already that it's way, way, way above 1,000 people, 1,200. Now, it was not only exciting to us in the healing explosion in, in Pittsburgh, but one of our men, he's here, he's a radio engineer. He's a very level-headed man. He manages all of about uh, eight or nine uh, large radio stations. Uh, he does all the engineering work. He's very level-headed, but he saw his first vision, and he saw Jesus. And he saw Jesus in the most unique way. Jesus was up there dancing, and he was just rejoicing, and he was so happy. And uh, when, he, when he saw him, well, pray, give him a hand. Hallelujah. Now, when, we, when the message that went with that vision came in was, uh, Jesus said, I've been waiting for this 2,000 years, and it's happening. It's happening to the body of Christ. That is what Jesus said will happen. It must happen. It has to happen before Jesus comes back. When God said, let there be light, it had to happen. You couldn't have found darkness in front of God's mouth or anything. It had to happen when he spoke it, just as vividly clear as when Jesus spoke forth and said, let the body of Christ go out and do miracles so that they'll believe in me. And they're seeing a living Jesus. And that is the beginning of healing explosions. This is number two. We go immediately from here to Atoma Island. Well, then at the 22nd of uh, this month, we'll be in Denver at the big uh, Coliseum up there. Uh, then uh, St. Louis and uh, Minneapolis and many other places, Norway and Finland. And God is exploding this around the world because what's happening, multitudes are being trained how to effectively, efficiently, and uh, practically minister healing on a repeated, consistent basis. I mean, you should never have sickness in your home. If you're married, your husband ought to keep the wife healthy, and the wife ought to keep the, healthy, uh, the husband healthy, and both of them ought to keep the heal children he healthy. But nobody seems to have ever known how to heal the sick. Sick Francis and I realized when we got to doing it that it's a very practical application of the power of God. If you go to a doctor, one of his tools is penicillin. And if he says, hey, you've got an infection in your body, nurse, give him X number of cc's of penicillin. And he says, now you'll be all right in two or three days. You ought to be rid of all that infection, feeling pretty good. And take the nurse, and she goes over, and she reaches up, and she's got 100 new bottles of penicillin. And she decides, well, that is too much to decide. And so she takes a, 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 that little syringe needle, and she pokes it into you empty. Do you get healed? No, of course not. You don't have the supply. Well, that's what's been going on in the body of Christ. We're filled just like a big bottle, five foot eleven and three quarters inches tall, this one is. Filled with God. 
filled with the penicillin of the Holy Ghost, and all we need to do is learn ways to inject that into the body of the people that are sick, and they will recover. Jesus said that, the, well, he didn't say they might. He didn't say sometimes. He didn't say with some people. He didn't say well people or healthy people go do it. He said every believer, you're going to do it. And so that's where a healing explosion comes about. And in the next three days, while we're here tonight, tomorrow night, and the next night, and the daytime sessions, literally at least we know of at least over 1,200, and it's open to the public, but we'll be particularly training those who've gone through video school and have studied the book to heal the sick. It's a practical thing, but it works, and it works effectively. And before the night's over, we'll share some of the things with you that are specifics that have happened through the first healing explosion. Now, number two, it's going to have... Uh, Carl Strader is going to have to open up a new building to have a library just to hold the books that will contain the miracles that will happen here this week. Is that all right? How do you do? Hallelujah. I believe that God's message for this particular hour, this particular day and time is exactly what Charles has said that the believer is to get off of the spectator stands and get into the arena and begin to do what we should have been doing for a long time. Amen. No longer is it enough for you to go to church on Sunday morning, possibly on Sunday night, never on Wednesday, unless you really have a real crisis in your family. That's, that, those were the days of old when that was all the Christianity was. But God is saying to the body of Christ, you get out every day and you begin to do the same things that the disciples did. You begin to do the things that my word says. And Jesus said that every would preach the gospel without exception. And sometimes some of the best gospel that is preached is never preached from a pulpit. How many of you know that? Now that's no reflection on your wonderful pastor here, but some of the best gospel I've ever preached has been out as I've been talking to people just on the street, in airplanes, in restaurants, and many places like that. And God is saying to the body of Christ to get rid of the shackles that hold you back and to get rid of that embarrassment which keeps you from witnessing about Jesus wherever you go and share Jesus wherever you go. Charles and I had the most wonderful, exciting day. Well, as a matter of fact, we've had exciting days ever since we were, we were here. Every day is exciting, isn't it, Charles? Our office, uh, our office staff often says to us, how come miracles always happen when you come home? We say, because we make miracles, because I believe God intends for every believer to get out there and to take advantage of every little situation that comes along and to listen to the Holy Spirit of God speak to you and tell you the, the numerous little things and the opportunities that he puts in your path. Last uh, uh, Thursday, I guess it was, we had been in uh, uh, Pueblo, Colorado, uh, getting ready for our heating explosion in Denver, and uh, something had just spoken to my heart as we drove down there, and I said, Charles, I really believe that God wants us to get up at the crack of dawn on Thursday morning and to drive up and to take a look at the location of the, uh, of the Kurgan Hall where the meeting was to be held. Now. You could say, oh God, I don't want to get up that early in the morning, but something just pricked my spirit and said you need to go. How many, do, how many times do you think that many of us ignore those little nudges of the Holy Spirit? Well, I want to show you what happens when you just follow after the Holy Spirit. So Charles and I, even though we'd had a wild, exciting meeting the night before, got up at the crack of dawn, got in a rent car, drove two and a half hours up to uh, Denver, went to a bank, the very first thing, to open up a bank account for the heating explosion there. And as we were there, we shared with the lady about Jesus, and, and we shared the fact that we were having a heating explosion. And of course, we always carry along books and, and little newspapers to give away to everybody that we happen to meet wherever we are. And so then we left there, and we went over to the Kurrigan Hall, uh, we, oh, we went to the uh, post office, uh, first of all, and the pro post, we had a little thing that had to be mailed back to our office, and so uh, we had asked them where post office was, and they said it was in the lower floor of a department store. So we went over to the lower floor of the department store, and I said to Charles, well, I'll tell you, why don't you go to the post office, and I'll go to the girls' restroom. So he said, okay, and so I said, then I'll meet you back by the escalator. Well, I came out, and I couldn't find Charles. You know where he was doing? As he was walking along, uh, walking through this department store, a young man said to him, how are you? Charles said, blessed. We never say fine. We never say terrible. We never say it's an awful day. We always say blessed because you have no idea what happens to people when you come out with a, a, a remark like that. So this young man turned around and he said, you must be a Christian. 
Charles says that I am. Now watch, watch at the opportunities that God gives you if you're just out there wanting and eager to do the things of God. This young man said, would you mind coming into my office with me a minute? So Charles went there. He said, you know, I've got this problem with my jaw. He said, it's I open my mouth and my jaw locks. He said, do you think you could do anything about it? Charles says, certainly I'd be glad to. And so the young man gets healed right there while Charles is waiting for me to get out of the restroom. There's a miracle on every corner. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, from there we got in the car and we went over to the Kurrigan Hall, which is where our meeting was scheduled to be. And as I walked in, the, Charles went to park the car and the man just almost floored me. He said, what are you renting this building for? Amen. I said, well, for a healing explosion. He said, you don't want this building. I thought, well, he's not very nice. I mean, we paid a deposit and he's the boss and all that, you know, but we paid a deposit. And I said, well, why? And he said, well, why don't you take the Coliseum? And I said, because the Coliseum is rented. I said, we asked for the Coliseum to begin with, but they told us it was not available, and that's why we had to take this. He said, you don't want this. He said, the Coliseum's available. I called today because he said, I looked at you, and for some reason or another, I thought to myself, they don't need to be in this building. They need to be in the Coliseum. Now, all of our publicity is out, and it says, it says at Kurgan Hall, but God spoke and he said, I opened it up for you. I had those people cancel out so you could be in the kind of a building where a heating explosion can be held. Now we have to catch a plane at 1235 because we're on our way to Pittsburgh to a big meeting up there. And so Char the man said, well, would you like to get in the car with me? So I got in the car with him. I think he smoked seven cigarettes in five blocks. Blue smoke all over me, blue smoke all over me, blue smoke all over me. I didn't say anything at that particular moment. And uh, I thought I'd better wait a couple of minutes. And so finally, Finally, he said to me, uh, you know, he said, uh, I gave up alcohol eight years ago. And I said, great. I said, I think that's wonderful. He said, yep. He said, I was an alcoholic. And he said, I just made up my mind. But he said, you know, I have a real problem with cigarettes. I can't get rid of them. I said, can I invite you to something special? I said, I'd like to invite you to the heating explosion. And uh, I said, I'll lay hands on you and you'll never be able to smoke again. He said, really? He said, you know, I want to tell you something. He said, the general manager of the Denver uh, uh, Convention Complex has diabetes. Did you ever hear of anybody getting healed of diabetes well how many of you know God just healed me of diabetes and gave me a bad brand new pancreas so I said to him well you just bring him to that healing explosion and I said I'll lay hands on him and I'll believe for a brand new pancreas well about that time uh, we got to the uh, Coliseum and the minute we saw it we knew that it was perfect for a heating explosion where the other building was not so we said now what do we have to do to switch over and get this one he said well we'll go back to the office and you'll have to sign a new contract I said I remember we have to catch a plane at 1235 because we're going we're going to Pittsburgh tonight so we got in a car and we ran back 16 more cigarettes billowing all over me so we went back in the office and the lady is typing up the contract because he called her from there and so we're standing there and he reaches over and he taps me and he said um, she's got rheumatoid arthritis can you do anything from her for her <laughs> hallelujah you see what God does all these little wonderful opportunities that he just puts in your lap and so I said to her well honey I said you come to that heating explosion and I said God will just touch you and get rid of that uh, a rheumatoid arthritis she said, well I don't know I probably would be busy I just don't know if I could come to something like that I said well you want to die of arthritis you want to die in a wheelchair you want all your bones to rot out of you because that's exactly what happens I said what have you got to lose she said I'll be there glory to God. <laughs> glory to God hallelujah then then another girl, another girl that was sitting there turned around. She said, she was typing up the contract. She said, can I come? She said, I got every ache and pain in the place. Would I be eligible to come in? I said, you certainly would. So you just come on in. Well, Charles and I signed the new contract. We were just so excited because we'd got, we'd been able to just talk about Jesus wherever we went and just throw out these little seeds, you know, all over the place. So we ran, got back in the car, turned it into, uh, turned it into budget, got, got in the budget van to go uh, to the airport, and a man sat down next to us, and Charles said, um, we're going to speak at the Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship Convention in Pittsburgh tonight. Where are you going? And the man said, Full Gospel? I'm a Baptist. 
But he said, you know, I've been to two or three of those meetings. Hallelujah. So we just had a real good opportunity to, to share with him. Then we got off of the plane. And I mean, then we got off of the little budget thing. And we walked up. Now, these are all things that happen just because you talk about Jesus all the time. And you're not ashamed to talk about Jesus. So we, I, we jumped off the little van. And I went to get a porter. And the man said to me, what is that pin you're wearing? He said, what does it mean? We do the stuff. I said, oh, I tell you, I trap them every time. I said, the same stuff that Jesus did, healing the sick, casting out devils, preaching the gospel. Do you know him? Hallelujah. He says, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And he went right down the line, gave me about 10 scriptures. He's a Pentecostal pastor at night, but he, he's a bell cap at the airport in the daytime. Well, we had the most exciting time, because on the way out there, uh, we had got upgraded to first class, because we had so many miles on our little, you know, uh, bonus plans. And so Charles took the whole time while we were flying out there to lead a stewardess to Jesus. Beautiful Catholic girl accepted Jesus as her Savior and Lord. Then she got the baptism with the Holy Spirit. And then she got healed right on a plane, right on a trip, all the flying out to Denver, Colorado. I tell you, we just had the most wild, exciting time. And you see, I believe this is what God wants each and every one of you to do. He wants each and every one of you to go out there and every day to experience these common, ordinary, everyday miracles that ought to happen to somebody. Well, we got to Pittsburgh uh, Thursday night, which was really exciting for us because it was the first time we had been back in the area after the Pittsburgh heating explosion. And when I got off the plane, a man handed me a rose and he handed me a little article out of a newspaper and I want you to read what appeared in the Pittsburgh Expression it says giving thanks I once was blind but now I see and it's by Connie Lardo she said on July the 4th I felt very impressed by God to attend the healing explosion headed by Charles and Francis Hunter I knew the Lord had a miracle for me, so I set aside all the usual holiday activities and I went downtown to the Civic Arena. For 10 years, I had been almost totally blind in one eye due to a blood disorder. When one of the prayer teams, did you hear what I said? Not Charles and Francis. Did you hear that? When one of the prayer teams laid hands on me and commanded the blindness to leave in the name of Jesus, God's power hit me, a burst of light struck my eye, and I could see. It was because of God's amazing grace that I can now say, I once was blind, but now I see. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, can I tell you something? That excited me much more than if the article had said Charles and Francis laid hands on me and I was once blind but now I see. It excited me because it proves to me that the body of Christ can learn. If Charles and Francis can do it, every one of you can do it out there too. I want every person here tonight to say if Charles and Francis can do it. If Charles and Francis can do it. I can do it too. I can do it too. If Jesus did it. If Jesus did it. I can do it too. I can do it too. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, I can even do greater things than Jesus did. I can even do greater things than Jesus. Because did. His Word says so. Because His Word says so. How many of you really believe that? You see, God's Word says you and I not only are going to have the ability to do it, but God's Word says that you and I will be out there doing the greater things than, than Jesus did. Because let me give you a, a real little revelation that God gave me uh, recently. Now, I know your pastor here is a fabulous theologian, and when God speaks to him, he always speaks to him in Hebrew and Greek. But I'm glad when he speaks to me... <laughs> He just speaks to me in English and makes it real simple so I can really understand. But I want to share a little revelation that God gave me that I hope will help every one of you here. If you don't get it the first time I tell it, I want you to listen very carefully because I want you to be able to understand why these people are going to step out who are on the healing teams who are going to step out with such great power and authority and confidence in their ability to lay hands on the sick and to see them healed John 14 12 this is a verse where Jesus said most assuredly I say unto you he who believes in me the works that I do will you do 
also did you see where I put that emphasis I put it on the word do not just have the ability to do and then he said even greater works than these shall you do shall you do because I go to be with my father then look at the promise that he said he said and whatever you ask in my name that I will do that the father may be glorified in the son and then he said yes ask anything in my name and I will do it those two verses are two of the most exciting prayer promises that are in the Word of God and yet we have taken them out of context many years and have not really understood what that was we were flying to Wichita Falls recently and I said God give me an understanding of what that really means when you said we could do these greater things and how we can do them and it was just like God said we'll keep on reading because it all goes together and so I continued reading and then I got the I got the idea of what God was saying he's saying when you are doing the works Jesus is saying when you are doing the works that I do and you're doing the greater works than the ones that I do under those circumstances you can ask for anything that the Father may be glorified in the Son then he said yes you see when you're doing my work now not when you're out there wallowing in sin not when you're out there saying oh God I don't have any money because I spit it all on a bunch of garbage and stuff like that then you can't ask anything in his name and he'll do it but when you're out there doing the works the same works that Jesus did and greater ones then he said that you could ask anything in his name and it would be done and to all of the people who are here tonight on the healing teams I want you before you step up to the first person on Tuesday night I want you to remember that because you're doing the works of Jesus you can ask for anything and it shall be done last night I had a little girl brought in front of me who had uh, well she had everything you can think of brain damage cerebral palsy scoliosis everything that you can think of and I stood there and I looked at her and in the natural I wouldn't have had a bit of faith how many of you know that in the natural I wouldn't have had a bit of faith but I said God I'm doing your work I'm doing what Jesus told me to do and I'm doing what Jesus said would make it possible for me to say to you that as long as I'm doing this I can ask for anything and it will be done so I said all she needs is a new brain and so confident that God's Word says when I do what he tells me to do and I'm doing the works of Jesus that he's gonna do his part so I said in Jesus name I speak a new brain into you and this little girl looked up at me and she says I got a new brain hallelujah <laughs> now remember this is a mentally retarded child was she mentally retarded when she said I got a new brain she wasn't the least bit mentally retarded because she couldn't talk up until that time I tell you if you don't think Francis Hunter fell apart you better think again I tell you, that's so exciting to just stand there and to see the see the supernatural and the miraculous power of God just unfold right before your eyes because you're doing the things that Jesus said that you should do I want to share another little story with you this is just a preliminary how many of you know that this is just a preliminary hallelujah but the doors are locked you can't get out hallelujah but uh, we had uh, some nurses on the healing teams there and we have a group of nurses who are coming from Tampa Florida to minister uh, here with us and this one nurse had come to one of the countdown meetings that we had had in Pittsburgh and she said that's the first time in my life I ever realized that God gave the responsibility and the authority and the power to a believer to lay hands upon the sick and heal them because you know that's what God's Word says those who believe how many of your believers all right he said those who believe shall lay hands upon the sick and they shall recover she said I never realized that I had the power within me 
to accomplish something like that but you know Jesus said all power in heaven and earth is given unto me and then he turned around and said behold I give you power I give you power I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and he said nothing shall by any means harm you well I'll tell you they were on they were in the Pittsburgh heating explosion and she said you know I was really disappointed because all I got to do was grow out arms and legs and that seemed so commonplace by about that time but they went back to the hospital and there was a man on a blue alert do we have any doctors here I think all then you know what a blue alert is don't you that means critical <laughs> you've had it that's the end and uh, it, he, this man was in intensive care and his family was all there except one and they said they had said well you better call the family the one son that's not here because his father is dying and that's it so the hospital asked them if uh, they could have the organs and the family said that they would donate them but then when they checked they discovered that the organs were so badly diseased that they could not be used at all his blood pressure was 30 over nothing how many of you know that's pretty bad <laughs> doctor answer me down there how much chance do you have to live when your blood pressure is 30 over nothing? Not very much, do you? Well, the nurse is in there and she's praying up a storm and, and the whole family is in there and they're all crying and everything. And she went back outside and God said, go back in there and command that spirit of death to come out. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How many of you would like to hear from God say something like that? So she marched back in there. I wish you could have heard her give her testimony last night. She marched back in there and she said, Bill, you going to heaven when you die? He said, oh, you know I'm going to heaven. And she said, uh, God just spoke to me. He told me to command the spirit of death to come out of you. So she says, devil, I bind you by the spirit of God in Jesus' name. You spirit of death, come back out of this man. Come out of this man in Jesus' name. I speak life into him in the name of Jesus. Now, this is recorded in that hospital. Well, would you like to know that where had they had been dripping medicine into him, not dripping it in, but just pouring it into him, and I, can, I don't know all the medicines that she said, unable, it, it was unable to bring up his blood pressure by the next morning his blood pressure was up to normal they took him out of intensive care they put him in whatever the next section down is and a week later one of the nurses came in who'd been on vacation and she said oh i've been meaning to check did bill get his eyes donated to the uh, to the eye bank and the nurse said no he still needs them <laughs> hallelujah <laughs> give jesus a big hand hallelujah I believe that those are the kind of things that God wants all of you out there doing. I believe it with my heart and my soul. This is not the day of the superstar anymore. This is not the day when we have these superstars who are, you know, the healing evangelists and so forth. This is the hour, this is the day of the believer. I believe that with my heart and with my soul. This is when God is saying to the body of Christ, rise up, rise up and be the kind of people that I have called you to be. How many of you ready to be the kind of person that God called you to be? All right, well, I'll tell you what I'm gonna do right now. I've got some real anointed announcements to make, but I think before I make the anointed announcements, I'm going to take uh, an offering for this heating explosion. How many of you are excited about giving to God? Let me hear you clap then. That's what we always do in our offerings. <laughs> Glory, and we let you whistle too, hallelujah. Hallelujah, well, uh, and I tell you, I just praise God for this wonderful church. And I thank God for the, the very, very fact. And I'm going to give credit where credit is due. Is that okay? Joyce Strader, wherever you are, I can't find you in this audience. And yet I know she's here. Anybody know where she sits? Point to her. Right over there. Stand up, would you please? There she is. Stand. Don't you sit down. Don't you sit down. I love Joyce Strader. I love both Carl and Joyce Strader. But last year when we were talking about our first healing event, explosion, there were many people who looked at us and thought it's not going to work teaching the body of Christ how to heal the sick because not very many people are going to be interested. But Joyce Strader got a hold of me and she said, I want the second one to be at the Carpenter's Home Church. Joyce Strader, from woman to woman, 
thank you for listening to God. Then she's the one that sold Carl on it. Hallelujah, isn't she? Oh, yes, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So I thank you because I believe that this, this, I believe the things that are going to happen in these next three days are going to shake the entire state of Florida. How many of you can say amen with me on that? Thank you, Jesus. We have never been excited as much as we are now about what God is doing to the believers to get them in the ministry, on the streets, wherever you go, in your offices, in schools, wherever you work, wherever you play, wherever you move. Uh, this is the work that God wants to do. Did you know that Carl Strader, pastor of this beautiful church, is not supposed to, as a pastor, ever lead anyone to Jesus? He's not supposed to minister the baptism. He's not supposed to cast out devils. He's not supposed to heal the sick as a part of the church. That's the believer's job, and they bring him in, and he matures them and makes disciples out of them so that they can go out and do the work of the ministry. That's his basic ministry. Now, as a believer, uh, he couldn't stand still without doing all of those things uh, individually. But the day has come and is now here when the believers are going to do it. They're going to do it. They're going to do it. Every believer is going to do it. But what is the purpose of this? Jesus came to earth to save the lost. He did not come to earth to heal the sick and cast out devils. But he healed the sick and cast out devils and did miracles and signs and wonders so that people would believe in him. And through believing in Jesus, they could be saved and they could go into heaven. And so that's our job, is to do miracles, signs, and wonders so that people will believe that Jesus Christ is still alive and that he can be their Savior. And simply doing a childlike little miracle like growing out an arm or leg or getting somebody out of a wheelchair, and to God it doesn't make any difference. None of them are hard for God. And then when we do that, people suddenly believe it's so easy to lead someone to Jesus if you heal them first. Now, the reason healing is so significant is that uh, people are more concerned about themselves than anything else. So if you get sick, even if it's a toe ache, uh, that's the, where your mind is, is on that toe ache or the cancer or whatever you might have. And so Jesus knew where to touch the heart of people. They say that the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. No, the way to a man's heart is through a miracle done by an ordinary believer so that people will believe. And that's the pure heart of man. Now, God is moving into this dimension so that the body of Christ will move out in such a phenomenal dimension. The Spirit of God is about to fall upon the earth in a new dimension, in a new power. It's the same power. It's all God's power, but in a new display of that power and glory. When the flood came in the days of Noah, they thought he was crazy building an ark. People may think you're crazy going out and healing somebody on Main Street. But that's all right. Noah was the one that was sitting on top of the uh, water that was on top of the world. And that was a destructive flood. But the new flood that's coming is a flood of the Spirit of God that's going to come so heavy upon this earth that it's going to change the whole life of people. Basically, three major things will take place in the course of this final act of the Lord Jesus Christ. One, Jesus Christ never wasted one word he even put it in writing to us so that there'd be no question about it. He made it simple. It's not complicated. And Jesus said, only the holy will see God. Jesus said, be perfect as I am perfect. Be holy as I am holy. He said, I'm going to come back for a bride without a spot or wrinkle or blemish. And if we tested you right now, and very likely Francis will, before this night is over, 95 to 98 percent of the people that are spirit-filled believers carrying the Bible, praising God, have sin in their life. God will not allow one little speck of sin in heaven. So how is this going to be accomplished? Are we going to go through life like uh, so many people? I can't quit smoking. We had a man before the service. I can't quit smoking, but I'm going to. I came here to get delivered. You can do anything you want to if you want to please God more than yourself. But how is this going to happen? Is it going to be that we're going to struggle with those carnal nature, that carnal sin? No, God's Spirit is going to come so powerfully and so mightily that it's going to happen to the whole world like it did to me in 1968. 
I had been a leader in my whole national church work. I did every job in church. Uh, people said that Charles is the best Christian I know. I was doing everything I could to live a holy life before God, but I still had these little nasty attitudes. I still had some little things in my life that I knew was wrong. Uh, people didn't know it because I didn't tell them. God didn't know it because I wouldn't tell him. <laughs> but I knew that I had these little things that were not pleasing to God. Only the holy will see God. Now, I'm going to see God. I went up there in 1969, it's translated into heaven, and I'm not going to miss it the second time. Don't you miss it either. But God cannot stand sin, and so what God is about to do on the body of Christ, and I'll show you in a second what he's already doing, he is going to move so mightily by his spirit that there's going to be a drawing power a drawing power of the Spirit of God on our hearts so much that we're going to release ourselves into complete submission to the Lord Jesus Christ and we won't care about our old carnal nature anymore. We're going to abandon that. We're going to die to self and Jesus Christ is going to take over our complete life. When I, when I finally, in 1968, I said, God, take all of my life and make me spiritually what you want me to be and I threw myself at God and I didn't care anymore and one by one by one he wiped out those desires to please myself, those little uh, sinful sins, sinless sins, if you want to call them, because most people don't think they're sinning, but they are. And as he began to weed them away, I walked into the abundant life, and it's been a glory trail ever since then to serve him and not my old nature. It's so easy to be totally committed. It happened to a man called Peter and some others in the Bible. Peter loved Jesus. Peter gave up his business to follow Jesus. Peter lived with Jesus. Peter would do anything for Jesus Christ. He knew he was a son of God. And yet, Jesus said, Peter, before the cock crows in the morning, you're going to deny me three times. Not me, Jesus. I love you too much. What happened? Peter's carnal nature rose up when they said, Peter, you're of him. And Peter saw himself on a cross being crucified, and he didn't like that. So he put himself above the Lord Jesus Christ, and he said, I don't even know him. I curse him. Why was that? Because the carnal nature in Peter still existed. It had not been removed. In the Old Testament, the way the carnal nature, the flesh of animals was removed when they sacrificed for sin, they burned every part of that animal into dead ashes and nothing was left of life in those flesh. And the same thing happened to Peter on the day of Pentecost. Not only did he receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speak in other tongues to be endued with the power of God, but the fire from heaven, God's Holy Ghost fire, came down on Peter, and it burned out Peter's old carnal nature, and Jesus Christ alone was able to live. And Peter stepped out the next day, and 3,000 people were healed when Peter said, I don't care what you do with him. I'm declaring Jesus from this day forward. God is going to baptize every believer with not only the Holy Spirit and they all will speak in tongues but God is going to put the fire of his spirit so mightily upon every member of the body of Christ and it'll multiply into hundreds of millions of Christians very quickly when that fire hits there'll be no more sin in your life you would rather die than ever sin against God again even a little tiny little sin like an attitude like I used to carry around or a cigarette or drinking or something like that you will become a holy bride for the Lord Jesus Christ without sin or spot or wrinkle or blemish. It will happen. <laughs> Hallelujah. And that's number one. When he gets us to be a holy people and God declared that he will have a holy people and when God declared it, he spoke it into existence. It will happen. It must happen. And it's about to happen. Let me show you. How many of you have had a hunger growing in your heart in the last few months to just simply release yourself and do more for the Lord Jesus? Wave your hands. Look around. God is pouring out of his spirit. It's already the water is coming up. The ark is beginning to lift out. The body of Christ is moving into the heavenly places to live a holy life. Second, 
Jesus Christ prophesied that every single believer would go out and preach the gospel, cast out devils, speak in tongues, handle the serpent, the old devil, and all of his poison, and heal the sick, and signs and wonders would follow the believers. That has never happened unless perhaps it happened with the disciples. But Jesus said it would happen, it will happen, it will happen very soon. It's beginning to happen. This healing explosion is just one of the things God is using to bring the body of Christ into the realization and the knowledge of how to go about daily performing the miracles of Jesus. When that happens, something else is going to happen. First of all, if every believer in this audience, if there's 5,000 here, if you went out tomorrow and duplicated yourself just one time, there would be 10,000, the next day 20,000, the next day 40,000. Do you know how long it would take to cover the 4.75 billion people one at a time with signs and wonders? Everyone witnessed to individually, every creature will hear the gospel. Jesus said you know how long it would take if we started with one Christian today and every Christian that was made a Christian duplicated himself daily it would take 34 days to reach 4.75 billion people individually one-on-one -on -one. and we've got at least the charisma said the other day I think it was 113 million spirit-filled Christians start with 113 million it'll all be done in a week if we'll do our job that's how fast Jesus will get the gospel out to every creature upon this earth. It won't be done by satellite as great as that is. It won't be done by radio as great as that is. It will not be done by the books by Charles and Francis or anybody else or all people as great as that is. It won't be done by churches. It won't be done by missionaries. That's all a part of what God is doing. But it will be done and accomplished when every believer living a holy life, acting like sons and daughters of God, go out and take the devil by storm and they will declare the works of the Lord and God will be glorified and people will be saved by the hundreds of millions. That's number two. Number three, God said and Jesus said there will be unity in the body of Christ on earth. There will be one form of unity. How will that come about? Will the Catholics join the Methodists? Will the Assemblies of God join the Presbyterians? That could happen, but it's not the way it's going to happen. We continually get more and more and more denominations. Within denominations, we get more and more differences of theological opinion, but that's not important to God. The things important to God is that when every believer is living a holy life and every believer is out daily winning people to Jesus with signs and wonders falling, they're going to be so excited and they'll have so much of the compassion of the Lord Jesus Christ for the souls of people that they're not going to think, they won't even remember what denomination, but this church is not even going to be partially large enough to contain the people in this area when every believer is living a holy life and preaching the gospel it will happen unity will be brought when the people are out doing the works of Jesus Christ it's on us right now it's beginning fast it's beginning to rain it's beginning to spread over the earth the world is being filled up not with the water in Noah's day but by the Spirit of God and God is doing a new thing and you better believe that this healing explosion here and and the Carpenter's Home Church is a vital part of the end generation as much as Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John was to begin this church. So it is going to be that these things coming about, not just the healing explosion, that's a tool God is using, but multiplied other ways that God is going to do. The earth is going to be filled with the glory of God, and that glory will be inside of people who are now born again, spirit-filled, and who will be because he will cover the earth with his glory in people. And those those same people will move out to cover the glory of God on other people because it won't matter whether we have a college education, whether we've ever seen the Bible as beautiful and glorious and necessary as that is. When the glory of God hits somebody that's a drug addict in adultery or whatever else, they're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit, not only saved, baptized with the Spirit, baptized with fire, and the power of God will come on them, and they'll go out and preach the gospel, and then they'll get in the Bible, and the glory of God, they'll understand it when they go through, and will become actually duplicates of the Lord Jesus Christ because he said those believers will go out and even perform greater miracles than he did to glorify Almighty God. Give Jesus a hand. I'm excited. Glory.
many of you can tell he's excited? He's just throwing all these notes around out of my Bible. These aren't really notes. These are, these are just little things that people have sent to me and people saying, I need to be healed of this and I need to be healed of this. And that was a little article and so forth and so on. I'll have him have, pick up the other one the next time. You know, Jesus wants you well. How many of you believe that? God's Word says, Beloved, I wish above all things, above all things, above everything else, that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospers. It is the prosperity of your soul that God wants. And as your soul prospers, that's when you can begin to walk in the prosperity of God and you can, be walk, you can walk in divine health. I believe that, God, that healing is God's second best. Divine health is first best. And I really believe that that's the way he wants all of us to walk. And I believe that we can walk that way if we will just begin, as Charles said, to make that total and that complete commitment to God where nothing else is any important. You know, Charles and I have two very interesting backgrounds. I was one of those wild sinners, and by the way, I was saved in Florida. Hallelujah! That's why Florida is very special to me. In Miami, Florida, I was a wild sinner 21 years ago, and uh, smoking five packages of cigarettes a day, drinking martinis like they were going out of style. I don't tell you this because I'm proud of it. I tell you because I'm proud of what Jesus Christ can do in a life. I tell you, I was the life of every cocktail party because I knew more dirty jokes than anybody else. I, I couldn't open my mouth and say four words without one of them being a swear word. But I'm delighted to tell you that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, and the old things have passed away. Behold, beloved, all things are become new. All things are become new. And from the day that I was saved, not a dirty joke has ever entered my mind, nor has a swear word ever crossed my lips. I went to the altar a wild sinner. I got up from there a saint of God, because that's what we're called to be, is a saint of God. And I'll tell you, I took off from that church that day. I was an instant fanatic. I mean, these days where we have instant pudding and instant iced tea and instant mashed potatoes and instant everything, we need a few more instant fanatics. I got up from that altar, and I knew that something had happened to me. I knew that Jesus Christ had come to live within my heart. I knew that, that all of my sins had been washed in the blood of, of Jesus. I also knew this. I know that God put a hate in my heart for evil the day I was saved. I looked at evil and it made me sick. And I cannot understand to this day how people can be saved, how they can be born again, how they can know Jesus lives in their heart, and how they can turn around and still want to go back and wallow in sin. Because Jesus said that you're a new creature and the old things have passed away. Behold, beloved, all things are become new. And I'll tell you, I praise God for that man. He greeted me two times tonight and he says, I came, I'm getting rid of cigarettes. How many of you know he's delivered already? You're absolutely right. When he comes into a meeting like that, you see, that's the way I went to church that Sunday morning down to a little church in Kendall, Florida, junkiest church I was ever in in my entire life. But when I got up that Sunday morning, I said, God, I'm not going to leave that church until I know that I know that I know that I know that Jesus Christ is living in my heart. And I'll tell you, that's the way I came out of that church that day. Talk about a rip-roaring fanatic. I was a rip-roaring fanatic. You think I'm bad now? You should have seen me then. I took off down U.S. number one, and I stopped at the shopping center where my printing company was located. I went into the drugstore, tried to beat Jesus Christ. Christ into the head of every person I met. I went down the, into the drug, into the restaurant, did the same thing there, went to the filling station, and I tell you, I preached Jesus wherever I went. And you know, people thought I had gotten senile. Some of them thought I had lost my mind. Praise God. The bank cut off my credit. How many of you has he cut your credit off? You know why they cut my credit off? I had never been late in one payment in my company all the years that I had been in business. But I got saved and began to act like a normal Christian. I was a fanatic. And the bank cut off my credit totally and completely. They would not allow me to buy any more new equipment on, pre on credit because they thought I had lost my mind. I did. I lost mine and I I possess the mind of Christ as a result of it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But I'm delighted to tell you this one year later, they gave me back my credit unlimited because the president of the bank got converted. Hallelujah. <laughs> then he knew there wasn't anything wrong, wrong with me at all. But God 
wants you well. That's one of the first things I discovered is that God wants you to walk in health. God wants you to walk in wealth. God wants you to walk in the joy of the Lord. I remember some of the great saints of the church where I got saved. They said to me, Francis, you can't be saved. You're too happy. I said, I'll pray for you. All I know is that I had read the word of God and Jesus said, I've come that your cup of joy might be full. I said, Jesus, I'll never make you a liar. I'll never make you a liar. And so I've had the joy of, my, of the Lord in my heart for 20 straight years. Some of them said, oh, you'll get over it. I said, I'll pray for you too. Hallelujah. And I want you to know that today I'm more turned on than I've ever been 